Today I'm talking about painful periods, what causes it and what we can do to get you feeling better. Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. I'm a board certified OBGYN and today I'm talking about periods. What can make them horrible and what you can do to make them better because no, you do not have to live this way. As always, I've got references and resources in my show notes that I think will be really helpful, especially if you need a jumping off point to talk with your healthcare provider about what's going on. Oh, and hey, before we get started, if you wanna go ahead and subscribe because you like this kind of content, that would be really cool. And don't forget to turn on the bell so you're notified every time a new YouTube drops. First things first, definitions. So painful periods, the fancy medical term for it is called dysmenorrhea. And there's two different types of dysmenorrhea primary and secondary. So primary dysmenorrhea is when periods hurt and there's no other cause for it. It's truly a painful period and nothing is making it that way. This can be very common. Up to 90% of young people can experience this and it can happen right around when their period starts and within that first year of their period starting. What causes it? It's related to inflammatory messengers that are released by the uterus that helps the uterus contract to get the blood out of it, which is the point of the period, but it can cause pain elsewhere too. And sometimes it can go a little overboard leading to painful, crampy, yucky symptoms. Secondary dysmenorrhea is the other flavor and that's when you have a painful period because something is making it that way. The number one cause of this is endometriosis. This is when cells that are like the cells that you find in the lining of the uterus are found elsewhere. So they can be on the outside of the uterus, on the ovaries, elsewhere in the abdomen, on the bladder, the bowel, and they can just go haywire and cause really painful periods. Here are some other causes of painful periods. And as you can see, there's quite a few different things that can be causing trouble. From issues like cervical stenosis, where the blood can't get out of the uterus and builds up in the uterus, can be really painful, to other issues that have nothing to do with the uterus, such as Crohn's disease or other inflammatory diseases of the intestines. So what does dysmenorrhea or painful periods look like? It can look like cramping or fatigue, nausea, vomiting, having to take off time from work or school, headaches, dizziness, heavy periods. It can be different for everybody. So if you think you have one of these flavors of dysmenorrhea or painful periods, what should you do? First of all, do not grin and bear it. I know there's a lot of cultural beliefs out there that periods just suck and we're just supposed to deal with it, but that is not the case. Your life should not be turned upside down by your period. So the first thing you should do is let us know so that we can do an evaluation. You might be wondering, oh God, do I have to have a pelvic exam? Not necessarily. If it's very straightforward, you've just started your period, we think it's that primary dysmenorrhea, we can potentially skip over an exam, but if we do recommend it, it's because we wanna make sure we're not missing anything else. And if you have concerns about what an exam might be like or, or that you don't want an exam, you always are able to say no. And if you wanna prepare yourself for your first visit to the GYN or you need kind of a refresher, go ahead and click this card up here where I've already discussed it in another YouTube. So when we talk to you, we'll take a thorough history. We really wanna know, have your periods been heavy the whole time? Cool. <laughs> I have lost the battle with the backdrop and so we're just going to keep it going. <laughs> so when you come to see us to talk about your painful periods, we're going to take a thorough history. We want to know if these are new or if your periods have always been uncomfortable. Is there a family history of painful periods? And one thing we're really trying to get at here is, is there a family history of endometriosis? Because if somebody in your family has endometriosis, you have a 10 times increased risk of having it yourself. We wanna know if you've tried any other things and have they helped? Do you have new sex partners or bleeding after sex or pain with sex? In addition to your pain, do you have heavy bleeding? So we just wanna get a really good idea of what's going on for you. So it's true that we may need to do a physical exam and we may want to see if we can feel any fibroids, if your uterus feels enlarged, if we find any concern with your pelvic floor muscles or nerves, anything like that. And then we may need to go ahead and order some additional tests. We may do a pelvic ultrasound to see if we can see any fibroids, any ovarian cysts, or anything else that could be causing trouble. Sometimes we even do other imaging, like a CT scan or an MRI, although not always. We may wanna rule out other tests for infection. And it may be that we recommend surgery as a way to diagnose what's going on, whether that's a laparoscopic surgery, where we make a small incision on your belly and we put in little tools and a camera so we can see inside, or a hysteroscopic surgery where we put a camera in through the opening of the cervix so we can see into your uterus. And that might be for something where we're looking for uterine polyps or other growths in the uterus or any developmental abnormalities with the uterus that could be a reason why period blood might not be draining appropriately. Good news, we've got treatments. The bad news is that sometimes people go years before they even seek care because they just think they're supposed to suffer or even more years before they get a diagnosis. 
So the first thing we often recommend are NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Remember how I said that with your period, you produce prostaglandins or those inflammatory markers that make your uterus contract? Well, you can dampen that response down a little bit. And the best way to do it is to take these medications a day or two before your period is expected so that response isn't as robust. And then you can continue it for the first few days after your period starts. One great example of an NSAID is ibuprofen, but that's not the only one out there. And you can talk to your doctor about what might be good for you. When it comes to other pain medicines like opioids, like narcotics, we try to avoid them because there's a really high risk of dependence, but also a high risk that once you stop taking them, you're going to have more rebound pain. So we try to avoid that if possible. And yes, we do sometimes use birth control for period pain. You may say, well, that's all OBGYNs ever do. And that's not the case, but it is something that we do often because a lot of times it can work pretty well. Now that doesn't mean it works for everybody and it doesn't mean that you have to go on birth control in order to feel better. The way that hormonal birth control works is that it stops the fluctuation of estrogen and progesterone and so the tissue and the lining of the uterus that's responsive to that and then can release those prostaglandins, that cyclic thing doesn't happen every month and so you don't have that increase in prostaglandins and thus that increase in pain. And you can use it in a continuous way, whether it's a pill or the ring um, or the patch, and so you don't have to have that withdrawal bleed and have a week where you're not feeling so great, but you can talk to your healthcare provider if that might be right for you. Also, we need to talk about exercise and sleep. We know that when you get better sleep and when you're more active, there's data to support that it can help your periods be less intense. Smoking is another thing that if you are smoking, cutting back or quitting completely can really help your painful periods. When it comes to supplements and vitamins, the data is limited. So if you have read on something and you want to try something, I'm not saying it's not going to work, but please check in with your healthcare provider to see if there's any good data about that one specifically, and also if it's considered safe with other medications that you might be on. The same goes for dietary changes. It is totally okay if you think that maybe caffeine makes your period worse and you want to get rid of it and see if things get better. That's totally fine. What's not okay is if you're told that you have to get rid of everything dairy, caffeine, alcohol, soda, all this stuff, and do it in sort of a shotgun approach because there's no data to support extremely restrictive diets. And while some diet elimination may help some people, absolutely give it a try, but doing it in a more targeted fashion can be better and can lead to you not having to be so restrictive. So it's important to check in, and it may be that we refer you to a dietitian or a nutritionist to really tease those things out. There are other complementary practices like acupuncture, yoga, um, TENS units, as well as biofeedback. The data on these is somewhat unclear, but for the most part, these aren't going to harm you. If you want to try acupuncture, be my guest, go for it. But if you want to try something that has definite data and you have a limited amount of money to spend and a limited amount of time, that may not be your first thing that we might recommend. But it doesn't mean it can't be helpful for a lot of people. And no matter what you try, if it's not better in three to six months, we need to know because we need to see other causes. Maybe we have assumed it's primary dysmenorrhea, but really there's something else going on, and that's a clue that we need to look deeper. If we've diagnosed secondary dysmenorrhea, that is painful periods because of something specific, well, then that's what we need to treat. If you've got enormous fibroid, we should talk about treatments to either make that fibroid smaller or get rid of it. If there are polyps in your uterus, we can do surgery to get rid of those. And so really the take home here is that if we think that it's primary dysmenorrhea, we've treated it and you haven't done better, then we need to go further. And that might be at that time trying surgery to diagnose what's going on or getting together a multimodal pain team that can help us such as a pain therapist, physical therapist, and that kind of thing. And when it comes to endometriosis, it's really important to know that just because you don't see anything on an ultrasound doesn't mean you don't have endometriosis. That's a diagnosis we can only make at the time of surgery. And when it comes to endometriosis treatment, that's beyond the scope of this YouTube, but it usually is a combination of surgery and sometimes medication, as well as ongoing therapy, because this is a chronic progressive disease. And if it's not treated in many people, it can get a lot worse. Here are my treatment takeaways for treating painful periods. Number one, birth control doesn't fix everything. It does make a lot of periods better, but it doesn't fix everything. And if it's not working, you shouldn't just keep throwing birth control at it. We have to look for other causes. And on the flip side, number two, birth control can help a lot of people with painful periods. So stop demonizing it and stop telling people that they're doing terrible things to their body because they're taking birth control, if that's what's working for them and making their life livable. I've got lots of other YouTubes on birth control, so you can click the playlist here to get more information that's evidence-based, referenced, and not about fear-mongering. Number three, if you're hurting and things aren't getting better and you feel like you're not being heard, it's okay to ask for another opinion or to make a referral yourself. 
your life should not suck because of your periods. Number four, knowing what's normal and what's not normal can help you speak up and get that help sooner. So the references and resources in my show notes can really help you understand that even a little bit more. And I hope this YouTube helps you feel that you're empowered now to know what to speak up and ask about. And lastly, number five, complementary therapies can be really great for some people and not so great for others. And sometimes they can hurt more than they help. And so it's just really important to be very open about what you're trying with your provider so that we can weigh in, help you tease through the data, figure out if something might be good for you or if it might be time to pull back on a particular therapy. If you've had painful periods, let me know what's helped you or things that you've tried or things that didn't help in the comment section and drop your questions down there. And go ahead and follow me on TikTok and Instagram for more. And thanks for hanging out with me even during my background change failure. But you know what? We're OBGYNs. We're flexible. We just keep going. <laughs> All right. Have a good one, everybody. Stay safe out there. Bye-bye.